Welcome back to the lecture on mathematical finance. In the last lecture, we discussed some basic notions of financial engineering. From that lecture on, I would like to start with introducing um, the mathematical theory, namely the theory of stochastic processes and martingales in discrete time, uh, which will be useful in order to model and analyze uh, so-called finite financial markets later on. In this first lecture, I would like to focus on the notion of stochastic processes, the notion of filtration, which is nothing else but a way to encode a flow of information uh, into our favorite probability space, and random times, more precisely stopping times. But let us have first a look at uh, stochastic processes. And for that, I would like to uh, fix notation. So I denote by omega fp my favorite probability space. Think of that space as sitting in the background. I would like to fix as well a measurable space, uh, which I call E, and the corresponding sigma algebra is denoted by calligraphic E. And moreover, I need an index set which should be non-empty. And the interpretation of this measurable space in, in the index set is as follows. Um, under the um, measurable space E, uh, you should uh, imagine a kind of state space of your stochastic process. And this could be something like the locations or the value of a security or the temperature. And on the other hand, this index set i represents the time of our stochastic process. So here comes the definition what we should understand under a stochastic process and a path uh, or realization. So a stochastic process is nothing else but a family of um, so a family which is indexed by the set i of um, random variables with values in this um, state space E. And these random variables should be defined on our favorite probability space. And in case we fix an omega in this set uh, capital omega, we call the map uh, x omega, which simply uh, takes uh, t from our index set and maps it to um, the value xt omega, a realization or sample pass of our stochastic process. And you see, um, there are various ways um, of, uh, of different stochastic processes. In case um, the index set i is a finite, dis a finite set, then this is nothing else, so a stochastic process is nothing else but a vector of random variables. And in case it is an, an uncountable set, it's simply a sequence of random variables. Uh, you see it becomes a little bit more complicated in case the index set is continuous. And you see on the other hand, the state space, um, which might be of interest for us, there's a huge variety of choices. It could be either finite or countable infinite set. It could be a real valued or values. This process takes values in RD. It could even be function spaces. So what I would like to do now, I would like to give you um, a sketch of how a realization of a stochastic process may look like, such that you get a better um, understanding of what is meant by that map. So well, uh, here it is. So uh, on the x-axis, you see uh, the values of our index set. Imagine the index set i um, is discrete. And on the y-axis, you see the values um, taken from our state space. So imagine E is just the real numbers. And you see now, uh, if I fix an omega and I consider this family 
for fixed omega as a function of the index set i, namely as a map uh, which maps t to um, x t omega, it could be that um, you get the following curves out of that. Namely, it could be either this blue curve for one choice of omega. And now if you change omega, you maybe get a completely different curve. And you see here, if our index set is discrete, of course, these are just um, discrete values. So, and these lines in between are just for illustration. In case your index set is continuous, it could be that uh, you have this kind of continuous path. There's about no reason why it should be a, a continuous trajectory. It could also be con piecewise constant and then jump in between. So there's a huge variety of choices. But that are the pictures of, um, of, a, of a realization of um, sample paths. So in order to distinguish um, uh, the processes depending on um, the way the index set is chosen, we have the following definition. We call the stochastic process a discrete time process if this index set i is either finite or countable infinite. And otherwise, we call that stochastic process a process in continuous time. So I would like to give you um, a couple of examples of different uh, stochastic processes. So the first one is the following. So suppose your index set i is uh, continuous. Let's say the uh, non-negative uh, reals. And moreover, I would like to choose a family indexed by these values on i. Uh, of identically and independent um, uh, random variables with values, let's say, in R. And by this calligraphic B, I would like to denote the corresponding Braille sigma algebra. And then I would uh, this um, family or this stochastic process has also a name and it is called white noise process. And you can imagine why. Um, if you view that as in uh, its, its um, realization as a function of, of time, you see it, it fluctuates quite uh, a lot. So it looks like just some noise in the background. The completely opposite are so-called deterministic processes. And they are defined in the following way. So here's an instant of that. Imagine xt omega is defined as 1 plus r to the power t. And this, is the, uh, this, um, uh, this holds true for all omega and omega. So in here, um, t I have chosen from, from the natural numbers included 0. And this r should be larger than minus 1, for instance. And you see this process simply grows over time. Namely, at time point t, it has the value 0. At time point 1, it has the value 1 plus r. At time point 2, it has the value 1 plus r squared, and so on and so forth, for every omega. And that's why it's called deterministically, or it evolves deterministically. It's a deterministic process. And uh, this choice of deterministic process um, might be of interest for us, maybe, uh, because it's, it's, it's a model of, of a bank account with interest rate R. And you see, as long as um, R is strictly larger than zero, it could be um, that you have um, positive or negative interest rate, so meaning the, the value of... Uh, or the amount of, mon of money on your bank account may increase over time or may decrease, and which is typically typical for our current uh, financial situation. Well, so these are two kind of extreme examples. Here's also an important example, uh, which we will see later on as well. 
It is the so-called symmetric random walk and it is defined as follows. So it is a process in discrete time. So my index set will be uh, the natural numbers including zero. And in order to define it, I consider a sequence Zn of independent R-valued random variables, which have the property that Zn is um, integrable and uh, the expectation of Zn is equal to zero. And then I define the stochastic process in the following way. The value of the stochastic process at time point zero I fix and I, let's say to the value zero for simplicity. And then xt for any t larger than zero is simply defined as this partial sum, namely the sum n from 1 to t of zn. So and this uh, stochastic process is then called symmetric random walk. Uh, and this uh, symmetric refers to the fact that uh, these random variables zn has expectation zero. And in case um, the random variables Zn um, have the following distribution, namely the probability that Zn is equal to 1 is equal to the probability that Zn is equal to minus 1 and this is equal to the value 1 half. And then the corresponding stochastic process is called simple symmetric random walk. And you see how this uh, process evolves over time. You start at zero, you toss a coin, if the coin comes up head, you go one step up, and whereas if it comes tail, you go one step down. And then at the next instant, you repeat that procedure. Suppose at the first instant you went up, you toss again a coin, then it could be that you went up again, or you might, uh, may also return to the value zero. A slightly different model is a so-called a multi-period binomial model. And in order to define it, I first of all fix two uh, parameters, u and d. And u stands later on for upward step and d stands for downward step. And um, I would choose u and d in the following way, namely d should be strictly larger than minus 1 and uh, u should be strictly larger than d. Moreover, I fix uh, a value p in the open interval 0, 1. And then I consider again uh, a sequence of um, random variables, which should be um, independent and identically distributed. And the distribution is as follows. The probability that Zn takes the value u is equal to p, and the probability that uh, z1 takes the value d is equal to 1 minus p. And then I define the stochastic process in the following way. At time point 0, uh, I um, assume a deterministic value, namely, let's say, the value x0, and should be strictly positive. And I define uh, xt for any value t larger equal to 1 uh, in the following way. I take the value from the last step, namely xt minus 1, and I multiply it by the value uh, 1 plus zt. And you see how that process evolves. Suppose you start at 1. And suppose the value u is equal to 2 and the value um, d is equal to 1 half and let's say p is equal to 1 half as well. So then the process does the following. You start at 1, you toss a coin. If it comes up ahead, you jump from 1 to 2. If it comes tail, you jump from 1 to 1 half. Then you repeat. Suppose you went up. You're at 2. You toss again coin, suppose it comes up um, uh, head again, so you go then from 2 to 4. Whereas if uh, it comes tail, you go from 2 back to 1. 
and so on and so forth. And this kind of model uh, is suitable to model uh, the evolution of a, of, a, of a stock. We can generalize that model uh, quite easily and this is done uh, or this is understood as a so-called binary splitting or binary model. And this is nothing else but a stochastic process in discrete time. So here the index set is simply the natural numbers including zero. And in order to define it, I take a sequence of um, random variables uh, indexed by uh, so UK. And these random variables should take values in the set minus one one. Additionally, I um, consider a sequence of functions ft and the functions uh, ft for fixed t is defined uh, is a map from r to the t minus 1 cross minus 1 1 to r and uh, I have to fix also an initial value and then I set um, the process x at time 0 to the value x0 and xt, and this is more interesting, is defined in the following way. I take the function ft, I plug in the values of the process up to time t minus 1, and additionally, I plug in this random variable ut, which only takes two values. And you see why it's called a binary model, because you have only two different uh, outcomes uh, of that um, uh, process uh, um, x at time point t given the values from time point uh, 1 to time point t minus 1. Namely, either the, this value if you plug in here a plus one or if you plug in a minus one, you get the second value. That's why it's called a binary model. So if you would include here a function which, let's say, take, uh, takes not only ut, but maybe also ut and ut minus one, then you can uh, realize more than two values. And you see why there's a generalization of this multi-period binomial model. Well, let us try to um, choose in a correct way this sequence of functions ft and um, the random variables uh, u. And I claim that you have to choose ft, which is a map from uh, rt minus 1 cross minus 1, 1 in the following way. It only depends on the value um, x t minus 1 and uh, you have to multiply it by the following factor 1 plus uh, a linear transformation uh, of this value y. So y takes values in minus 1 1 and you see this linear transformation um, maps minus 1 1 to uh, the values u and d. Why? Well, let's plug in for y uh, the value plus 1. Then you see this term and this term, the d's cancel out. And so you simply get 2 times u. And this 2 times u then cancels out of 1 half. So you get the value u. So you get here the value 1 plus u. And this is the same as if z takes the value u. Likewise, if um, y takes the value minus 1, then the u cancel out and you get twice d divided by this prefect of 1 half, so you get d and this is exactly what comes out here if this random variable zt takes the value d. Moreover, um, um, we should choose uh, a sequence un of independent Bernoulli p distributed random variables and then it holds true that xt which is given by ft of x1 up to xt minus 1 comma ut is nothing else 
but uh, yeah, so in distribution, but one plus uh, zt times this value xt minus one, which is nothing else but the multi-period binomial model. Okay, so here we have seen a couple of examples of stochastic processes. Um, now we should think about um, the following, namely, uh, how can we compute the distribution of a stochastic process? Here's a problem. So a stochastic process is a family of random variables. How should one compute the probability that the family of random variables assume a certain value or what is the expectation of that? So it would be much more handy uh, if we if you have a random variable at hand, not a family of random variables. So and in order to find a solution for that, I would like to recall um, how to uh, construct the distribution of a measurable map. Well, so if you give yourself a measurable map, uh, x, so this is a map from omega uh, f to e with the sigma algebra calligraphic e, then this map is measurable if for any uh, set b from the sigma algebra or um, calligraphic e, the corresponding pre-image under the, this map x is contained in the sigma algebra f. And you see, once we have a measurable map, then it's rather clear how to define the distribution of that map under the measure p. We can simply define it as the image measure. So this means the following. Uh, if you take an event b from that um, sigma algebra e, the measure px of that event b is defined as the probability of all omegas in omega such that x of omega is in b. And you see by that um, analogy, it's clear what we should do. First of all, we should come up with a random variable, which describes our stochastic process, which is this family of random variables. And for that, we change slightly perspective. So we introduce an object which looks a little bit complicated. So we consider the following mapping, namely uh, a mapping which takes omega and maps it to x of omega and x of omega is simply defined as the sequence x t of omega for t and i. And you see this um, function or this map here assumes values in this product space uh, e to the i. So that's a Cartesian product um, of um, the number of factors given by the cardinality of that set. And you see it's rather complicated because in case this index set is countably infinite, then you have an infinite product, uh, Cartesian product, or even countable infinite, uh, uncountably infinite, then we have a rather complicated structure. Okay. How should one interpret that set? Well, there are different possibilities. One way is to interpret that set as um, the set of all maps from i to e. Another way is also to interpret that set uh, e to the i as a set of all families xt with t and i, such that xt is in e for all t and i. Okay, we have here a candidate for our uh, random variable. Uh, what is missing? Well, for a random variable, it should be a measurable map. Or if a random variable is a measurable map. So far, we have just a map. So how should one equip uh, that uh, complicated space 
e to the i uh, with the sigma algebra. And you see, the, the answer is quite simple in case um, the index set i takes only finitely many values. Let's say values 0, 1, up to some capital T. Then this, there's a natural candidate, namely to choose for that um, sigma algebra e tensor i is simply the tensor product of these um, sigma algebras, which is nothing else but the product sigma algebra on that uh, finite dimensional space. So can one generalize that idea in some way? Well, in order to do so, uh, let us first introduce uh, the projection. Namely, for any t and i, I would like to denote by pi t the projection of elements from that product space e to the i onto the space e. And this is simply uh, done in the following way. I take that sequence xs with s and i, and this sequence is simply mapped under pi t to the value xt. And now I define this as the infinite product sigma algebra um, e tensor i as the smallest sigma algebra on uh, e to the i such that all projections are e tensor i comma e measurable. So meaning that this sigma algebra e tensor i is generated by um, all the uh, um, projections. And this simply means, so this notation means, you take all the um, elements in your sigma algebra, you take the pre-image of these element, elements under this projection pi t. This you do for every t, so this gives you a huge amount of that, and you take then the sigma algebra that is generated by this huge amount of sets. So here a couple of remarks. The first remark is a trivial one, namely these projections pi t are uh, e tensor i comma e measurable, and this is by definition. And the second remark is the following. So there's a different uh, way to generate uh, the sigma algebra e tensor i, namely via the so-called cylinder sets. So what are cylinder sets? So cylinder sets are sets of the following form. So let me read that for you. So I fix time points t1 to tn uh, in my index set i, so n is an arbitrary natural number. I give myself um, uh, sets AT1 up to ATN taken from the sigma algebra E. And now I consider the pre-image of AT1 under the projection PT1. So this is a set um, in the space e tensor i and this I do for all these um, n time points and I take the intersection of all these sets. So this is a, this is a kind of set um, which is in the generator of that sigma algebra and you can view that slightly differently and you can also write that simply as the Cartesian product for t and i of these sets a t and these sets a t are defined in the following way a t is equal to e if t is not uh, in the set t1 up to tn and otherwise it's just these sets a t1 up to a t n which we have chosen before. You see why it is called cylinder set? Imagine for a moment that the index set consists only of two values. And suppose that, let's say 1 and 2, and suppose that um, A1 is chosen from E, then you see, okay, you take the pre-image under the projection, and you take the uh, uh, Cartesian product with the space E, and this looks like a complicated um, cylinder uh, 
in, in, in our space because it, in one direction is the whole space and in the other direction it's, it's given by um, this pre-image of the set uh, 81. Okay, so here comes now the, the most important lemma, namely it tells the following. So consider uh, a family of maps uh, xt and this xt for t and i is a map from omega to e and I consider a map which I call x which goes from omega into the space e to the i and it is defined as uh, in the following way x of omega is simply the value x t of omega for t and i so this whole sequence and then the statement is the following if uh, x t with t and i uh, so this family is a stochastic process if and only if this map capital x is um, f comma e tensor i measurable meaning that this um, map x is a random variable. So how to prove that lemma? Well here's the first observation. So I can rewrite uh, xt in the following way. Namely I can also uh, get that value by applying the projection pi t um, onto the um, map capital X, right? So keep that in mind because this will be important uh, during the proof. So what, so we would like to prove first the direction that if this family X, T with T and I is a stochastic process, then it implies that this map capital X um, is measurable. How to check measurability? Well, it suffices to check measurability on the generator of these sets here. Well, we know by definition this sigma algebra here is generated by the projections. Uh, so what does it mean? Well, I give myself a uh, um, uh, set A from the sigma algebra E. I consider the pre-image of that set under uh, the projection part E and I know that these sets are contained in the generator of the sigma algebra E tensor I. So what I have to do now is I have to show that this is a pre-image under this map X of that complicated set is contained in the sigma algebra f. So why is that true? Well, first of all, I can rewrite um, the pre-image of the pre uh, the pre-image x or x to the minus one applied to pi t to the minus one of a in the following way. That's nothing else but the composition of pi t with x to the minus one of the set a. But since we obs uh, observed here and the composition of pi t composed with x is nothing else but xt. So I have here now that xt to the minus 1 of a. So this means the pre-image of a under the map xt, but by assumption xt is a stochastic process, meaning that for every t in i, xt is a random variable from uh, uh, omega f to e with the corresponding sigma algebra calligraphic e. So this means nothing else but that this map here is, uh, uh, so this set here is contained in the sigma algebra f. So we have checked now um, the measurability condition on the generator and this immediately implies by standard theorems from measure theory that um, for any set in the sigma algebra e tensor i this is true meaning for any set e tensor i um, the pre-image 
um, of it on this map x to the uh, uh, x is in the sigma algebra f. So here we have checked uh, simply the um, that x is measurable. Let us have a look at the other direction. For that purpose, um, uh, we observe the following. So by assumption, we know that the map x is uh, um, f e tensor i measurable. Moreover, we know that the projections pi t are uh, e tensor i e measurable. We also know that compositions of measurable maps are measurable. Hence, it immediately follows that the, the map x t is f e measurable, meaning that f t is a random variable. This holds true for any t, and this shows then that this, um, this family of maps x, t with t and i is a stochastic process.